Good afternoon and happy new year. Today we kick off the Federal Society's 2023 practice group programming with another installment of our uh, A Seat at the Sitting series. As you know by now, this webinar is designed to preview the January Supreme Court docket in 90 minutes or less. Uh, once more, we are happy to have uh, with us a panel of accomplished legal experts, and we are delighted to learn more about what will be in front of the court very soon. Uh, my name is Nate Kazmerich. I'm vice president and director of the practice groups. As always, please note that the Federal Society doesn't take any positions, and all expressions of opinion belong to our guests. We are certainly very happy today to have uh, Anna St. John leading uh, the discussion. Anna, welcome. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Great, well, very well. Uh, we are excited to have you and excited to, to have uh, today's presentation. Anna is the president and general counsel of the Hamilton Lincoln Law Institute. Since March, 2015, she worked for the Center for Class Action Fairness, which has moved over to Hamilton Lincoln. She has argued in dozens of state and federal trial and appellate courts, returning over 100 million in settlement funds to class members. Uh, previously, she clerked for Judge Barksdale on the Fifth Circuit and was an attorney with Covington and Burling. Anna is a graduate of Columbia Law School, where she was a James Kent scholar. Full bi bios for Anna and all our guests are available on our website and the promotional emails you received for today's program. In a moment, I will hand it off to Anna. Uh, once the group has reviewed the upcoming cases, we'll go to audience Q&A. So audience, uh, please prepare your questions. Questions can be submitted via the Zoom Q&A function, uh, and we'll do our best to address as many of the questions as we can and, and time allows. With that, uh, thanks for being with us this afternoon. Anna, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for that, Nate. And thank you to the Federalist Society for providing this forum and so many others for us to expand our knowledge of today's most important legal issues. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you and with our esteemed panelists. As you know, our program is called Seat at the Sitting, January 2023. This month's session has been called Quiet and Low Profile. I'm curious to see if our panelists agree with that description or perhaps it's simply a direct comparison to the handful of truly blockbuster cases heard earlier in the term. While I'm not certain of their opinions, I am certain we'll have a lively and interesting discussion today. We have resolved to limit our discussion to 90 minutes. It is far too early in the new year to be breaking resolutions, so we will be sticking firmly to that time limit. In just a moment, I'll introduce our wonderful panelists. Then each one of them will give an overview of one of the cases, I'll then give a very brief overview of two additional cases. And following that, we'll have some cross discussion among the panelists, and we will save time for questions from you, the audience, at the end. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask any of our panelists, as Nate mentioned, please submit it through the Q&A feature at any time during the presentation. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing those toward the end of the program. So without any further ado, let's get started. Our first panelist is Tessa Schur. She is a litigation associate at the Fairness Center, where she focuses on representing clients in state and federal courts and before administrative boards. Tessa graduated from Penn State Dickinson Law School, where she served as managing editor of the Dickinson Law Review. Prior to joining the Fairness Center, Tessa counseled high-level leadership at the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Policy on legislative and regulatory matters. She assisted the Department of Defense with procurement and she worked on both civil and criminal cases at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. She's also authored an academic work proposing a new regulatory scheme for digital assets and cryptocurrency. We're excited to have you here today and hear your thoughts on the Ohio Adjutant General's Department Federal, the Federal Labor Relations Authority. That's a mouthful. Next, we have Professor Richard Epstein, who's very well known to many of you. He's the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law at NYU, the Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institute, and the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus and Senior Lecturer at the University of Chicago. He has taught courses in administrative law, antitrust, constitutional law, contracts, and a whole host of other subjects. He is the founder of the Classical Liberal Institute at NYU Law School. He's written and spoken extensively on a wide, wide range of topics. I know many of us have had the pleasure of listening to him and reading his works. 
you know, truthfully, we could spend the whole panel on his biography, but I promise to keep our introductions short. So we look forward to hearing your perspective, Professor. Last but certainly not least is William Hodes. Professor Hodes was a professor of law at the Indiana University School of Law from 1979 to 1999, where he taught professional responsibility, constitutional law, and civil procedure, a collection of subjects referred to as the law of lawyering. Professor Hodes took a sabbatical during October term 1996 at the age of 53 to serve as a law clerk to his law school professor, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, as a proud New Orleanian myself, I have to mention that Professor Hodes began his legal career in New Orleans at a small civil rights and personal injury firm after graduating with honors from Harvard College and earning his JD with highest honors from Rutgers Law School. For over 35 years, he co-authored the treatise, The Law of Lawyering, now in its fourth edition. And after retiring from law teaching in 1999, Professor Hodes began a solo legal practice, and he now provides representation consultation, expert testimony, pretty much anything you need to lawyers in the areas of the law of lawyering, as well as constitutional appellate, Supreme Court, and other complex litigation. We're especially fortunate to have your insights today, Professor, on In Re Grand Jury, because you actually filed an amicus brief in that case on behalf of the Association of Professional Responsibility Lawyers. So we're very happy to have you here today. With that, I will turn the floor over to Tessa. Thank you, Anna, and good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. This is a great way to start off 2023, and thank you to those listening and joining our discussion today. Thank you to Anna for the introduction and to the Federalist Society for putting together this program and inviting me to speak. I'm happy to kick off our discussion this afternoon by introducing you to Ohio Adjutant General's Department versus Federal Labor Relations Authority. This is a lawsuit between the Ohio Adjutant General's Department and the FLRA, which is the independent administrative federal agency that regulates the collective bargaining process between federal agencies and unions. Under the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute, which we will just call the federal statute, FLRA has authority to regulate collective bargaining activity of only federal agencies. So in this case, the Supreme Court will have to decide whether the Ohio National Guard constitutes a federal agency. Interestingly, for the past 45 years, the Ohio National Guard and its union have been organized under the federal statute. And on its face, that seems right, because it's undisputed that the employees of the Ohio Adjutant's General Department are federal employees. The Technicians Act tells us as much. But the relevant question for deciding FLRA jurisdiction is not whether the employees are federal employees. It's whether the employer is a federal agency. And now, the Ohio National Guard asserts it is a state agency, not a federal agency. And if that's true, then the FLRA does not have jurisdiction over the Ohio National Guard. This issue got to the court because of the way the FLRA regulates federal agencies' collective bargaining. Unfair labor practices were filed against FLRA excuse me, unfair labor practice charges were filed with FLRA against the Ohio National Guard. FLRA chose to issue complaints on those unfair labor practice charges. And by adjudicating those issues, the FLRA claimed jurisdiction over the Ohio National Guard. Now, the, the Guard asserts that FLRA had no authority to adjudicate those issues because it doesn't have jurisdiction over the, over the Guard to begin with. Its position is that the Ohio National Guard is a state agency, not a federal agency. So again, the court will have to decide whether the FLRA has the ability to regulate state National Guards, and that is the heart of this case. I would like to take some time to highlight interesting points that were brought up by the parties and amiki, starting with arguments in favor of finding the Ohio National Guard to be a state agency rather than 
of federal agency. The first and foremost being that Ohio National Guard is commanded by the Ohio governor. It's supervised by the Ohio Adjutant General, who is a state employee. And in fact, he's appointed by the Ohio governor and his responsibilities, his qualification requirements, and even his pay are set by Ohio state statute as opposed to federal. Further, state adjutants general have even been found to be liable as state actors under section 1983. So finding that state national guards are federal agencies does not necessarily mesh with that section 1983 jurisprudence. But on the flip side, there are arguments that the Ohio National Guard is a federal agency, specifically that the state National Guards are significantly funded by the US Department of Defense, which is undisputed that that is a federal agency. In fact, Congress even designated the National Guards as a reserve component for the United States Army. And as we touched upon earlier, the Technicians Act tells us that these employees, these technicians, have been granted federal employee status. So with these arguments in mind, on appeal from FLRA, the Sixth Circuit held that the Ohio National Guard is in fact a federal agency. Sp mainly because the court was bound by its own prior decision in which it held that FLRA had jurisdiction over the Michigan National Guard. And the court reasoned that while each state unit of the National Guard is a state agency, is under state authority, is under state control, they employ federal employees. So because these state National Guards employ federal employees, they are federal executive agencies. And, and the Sixth Circuit acknowledged that if it were to accept the Guard's argument that the Ohio National Guard is a state agency, then it would have created a circuit split, acknowledging that a handful of circuits have decided this issue, namely the DC Circuit, the Second, Fifth, Seventh, Eighth, and the Ninth Circuits have all decided that state National Guards are federal agencies under this federal statute. I will note though that the, the Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit's opinion acknowledges that if, if you're searching the, the statutory text of the federal statute, if you're looking for the text, something in the text that tells you that the State National Guard is a federal agency, you're going to come up short. So the Fifth Circuit has admitted that its opinion departs from the, the logical text of the federal statute. So I will, um, I, I'll wrap up with some comments about this, this issue in this case. The first being that I think we can expect the Supreme Court to overturn the Sixth Circuit and find that the Ohio National Guard is not a federal agency within the jurisdiction of FLRA. In past years, FLRA has continued to expand its administrative power without being checked by the court or really even being accountable to anyone. And right now, the court appears to be prepared to prevent FLRA from continuing to expand its power and expand its jurisdiction. And the court seems prepared to decide not to defer to agencies interpretation of its own statute. And it's important to point out that the, the scope of FLRA's decision is broad. It's not just pertaining to the Ohio National Guard, but it affects thousands of state National Guard employees across the country, not just in Ohio. And moreover, the reasoning FLRA's reasoning cannot be limited to National Guards because recall FLRA decided it had jurisdiction over the Ohio National Guard because it employs some federal employees. Now that's true of, there are a handful of other examples of federal employees employed by employers 
who are not necessarily federal agencies. So this reasoning we could see expanding to other fields and other federal employees, other employers becoming federal agencies for the purposes of collective bargaining, falling under FLRA's jurisdiction. And finally, allowing FLRA's decision to stand would revive a collective bargaining agreement with provisions that substantially violate thousands of first of employees first amendment rights. Um, and specifically their first amendment right to choose whether to associate with and to financially support a labor union. And at this point, I am short on time, but I'm happy to take questions at the end of the program. And if you are interested in digging into these issues in more detail, I refer you to the amicus brief that my colleague and I filed on this case. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Tessa, and thank you for your insights on what sounds like a very interesting case. Again, before we move on to the next panelist, if you have any questions, there will be an opportunity for those at the end. We look forward to those and appreciate those, um, especially you know, being able to hear what's of interest to you. So with that, I will now turn things over to Professor Epstein. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking about a case which I think has fairly broad significance in the endless battle to figure out what the relationship is between state law control over the activities of given unions on the one side and the National Labor Relations Board control over the issue on the other. Uh, the case itself involves is a suit against the Teamster by a company called Glacier. And what this company does, it supplies all sorts of heavy stuff and goo uh, that is shipped around in various kinds of mm -hmm. trucks. And the only way in which this works is you have to keep this thing mobile and moving so the trucks go sloshing around one way or another uh, until you deposit them. And what happened in this particular case is that the union had reached an impasse with the company over the new terms. And on the day in which it turned out that the old con contract had expired, uh, many of the people in driving the trucks, 50, 60, 70 of them, took them out on the road and then brought them back to the factory where they came out of the plant from which they came out. And they just turned them off and walked away. And so all of the concrete stuff and goo in there froze up and hardened, caused you know at least $100,000 worth of damage in one situation, probably a lot more in the other. And the question is, do you treat this as an act of industrial sabotage, which is out from underneath the National Labor Relations Act, or do you treat it as part and parcel of some particular situation in which the uh, exclusive jurisdiction over the matter uh, falls to the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, the case has a couple of very high-powered attorneys doing it. Uh, uh, representing Glacier is Noel Francisco. I'm happy to say he was one of my former and best students. Um, and uh, uh, they are basically trying to uh, overturn a decision of the Washington Supreme Court, which said that this thing was covered by the National Labor Relations Act, and so no private tort action would be allowed. On the other side, the Stanford group uh, headed by Professor Pamela Collin, has taken up the cudgels on behalf of uh, the particular union. Uh, to set this thing into place, it's necessary to go back to an earlier decision uh, called Garmin against another one of these unions, in which what we had was a situation in which the National Labor Relations Board refused to take jurisdiction over a particular case. And the issue in that particular case had nothing to do with uh, freezing trucks and so forth. Uh, but there was a union organization drive that had taken place. And the union, as is typical in these situations, insisted that the people who were members of the union uh, were the ones who ought to be given first preference in any organization drive. And the employer refused, saying that the uh, ranks of potential members of the union in this organization drive should include non-union members. And what happened is the National Labor Relations Board decided not to execute any jurisdiction over this. And so what the folks at the state court level did in California, is a very different California Supreme Court than the one that we had today, is they said, we looked around, this thing seems to be a clear unfair labor practice on the part of the union. What we're going to do is we're going to give an injunction on the one hand and damages of $1,000 on the other hand. Uh, this then gets back up to the United States Supreme Court, 
and it becomes pretty clear uh, that the injunction is going to be denied. And so then the question was, if the uh, uh, if the labor board refuses to take jurisdiction over the case, is an award of damage sufficiently coercive uh, that this is something that's going to be preempted by the uh, labor statute? And Justice Frankfurter said uh, that, yes, these things are substitute remedies. And so therefore, it turns out that even though the board has not taken the case, uh, it preempts the situation here. And so the action should not go. So the question is, how does this case then apply to the one that we have? And the first thing I think to understand is there is no question that a decision as to who is or not part of a drive for organization is absolutely at the core of the function of the National Labor Relations Act, and that the entire remedial structure of that particular statute is designed to say that it can give relief or not give relief in these kinds of cases. And so if the issue is, quote unquote, whether this is arguably subject to uh, the regulation of the NLRB, uh, the answer is perfectly clear. It is not only arguably subject to, but I think unquestionably subject to if it decided to take it. Uh, when we're dealing with the other type of situation having to do with the willful destruction of property, uh, that presents very, very different kinds of issues. And one has to say, well, uh, how does the NLRB uh, deal with those issues? And you must understand that the way the NLRB is organized is that it has all sorts of powers to order reinstatement, back pay, and stuff like that, but has absolutely no power whatsoever uh, to award damages for the willful destruction of property uh, that has been engaged in these particular cases. And so if you now say in this particular situation uh, that it is preempted by the National Labor Relations Act, you're saying that we have a wrong here uh, for which there's going to be no form of redress whatsoever. And the question is, how do you want to sustain that particular drug use? And if you, when you went back to the Washington Supreme Court, um, they went out of their way to try to make it appear as though the two things look rather similar. And what they said is any activity that takes place which is incidental to or parallel to uh, an organization drive is going to be necessarily swept up under the particular statute. Uh, it turns out that the statute, the reading in Garmin, however, is not, I think, particularly consistent with that point of view, uh, because what it does is Justice uh, Frankfurt, in an effort to figure out what's going on, uh, does the following. He says, there are certain matters of local feeling. That phrase seems to be rather nebulous, but the full phrase was local feeling and responsibility, uh, which are rightly put within the state. And then there are 13 separate references in the opinion to the fact that various acts of violence are, in fact, the kinds of things that are necessarily left within the framework of the state. And so what you have to ask is whether or not sabotaging these particular trucks counts as a form of intentional property damage, which I think it does. And therefore, the violence level seems to be a perfectly appropriate way in which to start to think of it, at which point the exception will start to overrule the rule. What is interesting is that neither the uh, brief on behalf of the union on the Supreme Court or the decision below uh, spent a great deal of time talking about the actual dispute which took place in Garmin, uh, because the moment you do that, the contrast between the two cases is going to be absolutely vivid, uh, that one of these cases, in fact, is uh, quite much within traditional state tort law situation, the destruction of property, and the other one is not. Interestingly enough, Another way in which this case can be talked about uh, and was discussed below is whether or not it turned out that the employees failed to take some steps in order to protect the property in question. And you know that is not an accurate description of what went on in this particular case. Uh, you could imagine a situation where there are workers and they're sitting on a truck and somebody from the outside comes in and tries to wreck the machinery uh, and to take the concrete load and destroy it. And what happens is the workers sit by and do nothing. Uh, that would be a case of non-feasance and uh, it'd be a trickier case as to whether or not you would get a tort remedy against mm -hmm. the workers, given the fact that you have a tort remedy against somebody else. But in this particular case, you were the guys who loaded the trucks you took them out, you took them back in, you turned the engine off, you walked away. And so it's a case of the willful destruction of the property by the workers, not the failure to prevent the destruction by somebody else. And the distinction actually matters 
because in the case in which somebody else does the tort damages, you have a remedy against that party. In this particular case, you have no remedy at all under these circumstances. Uh, so I'm going to make some kind of a prediction about the way in which this case is going to come out. I think that it is very clear if you sort of look at the sort of general politics that take place now, both in state courts and certainly in the Biden administration, uh, virtually everything that they do is something which is necessarily uh, devised in order to create uh, a very strong pro-union environment. Uh, President Joe Biden said he's the most pro-union guy you could ever imagine. And if you look at the opinion of the Washington Supreme Court, it's a pretty pro-union situation. The Supreme Court, I don't think, has that particular disposition. Uh, so I think I'm going to make a prediction in two parts. Uh, the first part is I think that the conservative six, um, and you know who they are as well as I do, are likely to say that the preemption argument cannot apply because this is a standard form of responsibility for the state, and nobody could infer as a matter of statutory construction uh, that the national labor law uh, was it meant to make sure that the states were helpless to deal with uh, concerted acts of violence, which is what was at stake in this particular case. The interesting case is what's going to happen to the other three. And, you know, my view about this is that this case is sufficiently unbalanced uh, that the decision actually should be unanimous, uh, pushing in the opposite direction. Uh, what happens is we give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and that turns out to be anything which has to do with the definition of a bargaining unit, the exclusion of various kinds of workers from an election poll and so forth. Um, but we run to run to the law, that is the state courts, those things which are not pertaining to union activities as such, uh, but are involved in the deliberate destruction of property, uh, for which we don't think anybody thought uh, that you have only the preemption of the board so that there's no remedy that's going to be allowed at all. And so on that particular note, I, I think I will turn it back to the cloud. Uh, I think it's an important case, not only for what it says about this particular dispute, but I do think it's going to be a harbinger of what is likely to happen in many of the cases that are surely coming down the pipe, in which on a whole variety of issues, the Biden administration has taken an extremely aggressive opinion about what is the scope of union rights and prerogatives under the National Labor Relations Act. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that, Professor Epstein. We appreciate your insights. It's a fascinating discussion. So thank you for providing that to us today. Uh, we now are going to take a break from the labor issues and hear next from Professor Hodes. The floor is yours. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot, Anna. And I, I first need to uh, just give one caveat about my voice. I don't have COVID. I don't have a cold. I don't have a sore throat. But just this is a lingering for many, many months or weeks at least of uh, sort of the uh, the after effects of a uh, of a cold that I did have, but I think I can manage all right. Um, the case that uh, I'm talking about, um, the In Re Grand Jury, which will be argued on the ninth, I believe, uh, it presents an opportunity for the Supreme Court to um, fine tune the standard for applying the attorney-client privilege in situations where the communications at issue involve giving or seeking legal advice plus giving or seeking business or other non-legal advice, however you define the distinction between legal and non-legal, and of course that will turn out to be the rub in many situations. In this case, uh, a law firm gave advice about the tax and other consequences of a client's decision to expatriate. And then a couple of years later, more tax advice plus assistance in preparing his tax returns, including the returns for some of the years when he was uh, in transition from the US to his expatriation. Uh, the client, by the way, was a was an early promoter of Bitcoin, um, not the most recent scandalous guy as far as we know, because uh, most of the record uh, 
is sealed in any event, but that's, that's the setting of the case. The case arose uh, when a federal grand jury subpoenaed documents uh, from the client's law firm. The law firm balked and the government moved to uh, compel uh, answers to the subpoenas. The district court uh, initially was actually fairly generous in upholding much of the law firm's claim of attorney-client privilege. It ruled that, quote, communications giving or seeking advice about what to claim on the tax returns constituted legal advice and thus are privileged. In addition, so score one, one partial point or so more for the law firm. In addition, even communications about the implications, I guess the legal implications of unsettled accounting questions are also communications about legal matters and thus are also privileged. Score two for the law firm. But when the communications had a dual purpose, in particular in this case, where one of the purposes was the actual preparation of the tax returns, putting in the numbers, but also you know, what forms to use and how to file them and maybe a little bit more than that, the district court ordered compliance, said that is not legal advice, separated out, and the law firm was ordered to comply with the subpoena with respect to those communications, but with an allowance for fairly generous redactions for the above types of legal advice. And so later we'll get into, so what really did the law firm lose? It was allowed to, had to turn over some things, but it was allowed nonetheless to redact a significant amount where both the, where, the, where at least the law firm and the court were in agreement that it was legal advice that could be redacted. But when the law firm continued to refuse even to turn over redacted uh, versions of the memos and communications, civil contempt followed. On appeal, the <clears throat> Ninth Circuit affirmed first resolving something of an intra-circuit split by clarifying that in these dual purpose communication cases, a dual purpose communication is not privileged unless the primary purpose of the communication was to give or seek legal advice. This is also sometimes referred to as the predominant purpose test, but the implication is clear in either event. There can be only one. If it's the primary predominant purpose, it's not privileged. I'm sorry, if the, um, if the, unless the legal aspects are the primary or the predominant purpose, it's not privileged, period. But that was not the end of the matter. The law firm argued for application of a competing standard from the DC circuit, which is what created the inter-circuit split and brought us to the Supreme Court. When it applies, the DC circuit test looks not to the single predominant purpose of a communication, but to a predominant purpose, or as it also phrased it, one of the significant purposes of the communication when there's more than one purpose. Now, according to the DC circuit, it is precisely 
um, in uh, when we were talking about dual purpose communications, that it makes the least sense to try to figure out whether the, the purpose was a singular A or whether it was a singular B, when by hypothesis, it must have been A and B. Um, plus, in most realistic scenarios, trying to assign an all or nothing predominance to one or the other is too difficult and amorphous a task. And that is in addition to the difficulty of drawing a clean line between legal advice and the other advice in the first place. Even before tackling which one and only one of those predominated. Now the Ninth Circuit found some merit in this approach, but refused to extend it from internal investigation of a client company, which is what was involved in the main Kellogg Brown and Root case in the DC Circuit to tax preparation advice as was involved here. And in large part, the Ninth Circuit refused to make that transition or make that extension because of the danger that companies might run everything through their lawyers and thus manufacture an accountant's privilege in the tax arena at least where the accountants were truly serving as accountants only and not as resources to inform the lawyers legal work where everyone agreed that the, everyone agrees that the privilege the attorney client privilege would attack would attach just as when a translator who is not a lawyer is uh, helping the client and the lawyer communicate um, and so on. Now in the Supreme Court, the parties and well over a dozen Amici lined up in favor of either one or the other of these tests, either the primary single purpose test or the A significant purpose test. And the legal press has largely assumed that the Supreme Court will pick one or the other of these, resolve the circuit split in a ruling with broad national significance, more or less in the manner of the 1981 Upjohn case, which concerned the attorney-client privilege, which concerned the attorney-client privilege as it applies to lawyers for uh, corporate clients consulting with various corporate agents and other constituents. The, um, the controlling group test or not the controlling group test and so on, but it'll have that same kind of sort of uh, gradually seeping down and becoming a national, um, a national standard gradually over time. But I have my doubts about that. The contending positions, as I've already laid them out, in my view, they slice the baloney so thinly, there is so much room for case-specific judgment that will remain even after the court settles on the precise verbiage for stating the standard. And there are so many clues that this case itself is fact-driven and situation-specific that I predict a narrow ruling that's at a minimum limited to the tax area only. And in particular, there was a lot of hedging, both in the Ninth Circuit opinion and in the briefs, for starters, about what counts as legal versus tax advice 
both generally and with respect to this law firm and this set of subpoenas. Thus, Supreme Court may be unwilling to commit to a single standard across the board, which is to say beyond the tax arena. And it might even contemplate, if it digs down further and further, it might even contemplate dismissing the writ of certiorari as improvidently granted. I want to say to the Federalist Society, save this tape in case I'm right on that one, because uh, that is fairly rare, but it happens maybe once a term or so. But here are some of the clues that lead me to that conclusion. First, the Ninth Circuit found that th this wasn't a truly close case of um, dual purpose um, communications anyway, where it's hard to separate out the legal and the non-legal components and then to rank them. Is it predominant or is it just one of several significance one? It found that the district court's finding that the non-legal advice was the one predominant purpose was not clearly erroneous. So it didn't really have to reach any of the, the, uh, the DC circuit's opinion. But that really means to me, and it might mean to the Supreme Court, that nothing really turns on which test is used because of the specific, case specific, specific findings of the district court. Second, even within the communications that the district court found were not privileged, it permitted, as I said, heavy redaction of the elements that were or that did constitute legal advice. And so you could say, and the Supreme Court could say, no harm, no foul. The law firm basically got almost everything that it wanted. And so once again, the stakes have been lowered. And third and finally, a seemingly innocent amendment to a couple of words in a footnote, which might catch the eagle eye of one of the clerks, could be the true case-specific merits rather than standards axis upon which this case actually turned. Footnote five, in the opinion that's before the court, deals with the danger that I mentioned before of creating an accountant's privilege if the client is smart enough to hire a lawyer to do an accountant's work. That footnote starts with this observation. We are aware, for example, that normal tax return preparation assistance, even coming from lawyers, is generally not privileged, end quote. Not much argument there. True privileges are in derogation of at least some pieces of the truth and must be narrowly construed. But in the original slip opinion, before it was amended, when petitions for rehearing were being denied, that first sentence, instead of referring to tax return, preparation assistance simply referred to normal tax advice. Now you can call me a nitpicker if you want, but it seems to me that an opinion discussing communications about tax advice and an opinion discussing communications about tax return preparation assistance are not interchangeable. They're wholly different, uh, especially when you are asking the Supreme Court to set a single standard for determining 
the contours of the attorney client privilege in the tax arena, let alone generally and nationally. Now, let me and I, I do have the, uh, I think the couple of extra minutes to close with this. Uh, I wanna say a word about yet another approach that gets at what I think are actually, that, that are unlikely to be actually addressed by the court, but I think are underlying it um, and, and that include this tension that I've already alluded to about what is it, you know, what is true legal advice and what is other advice and how do we mediate between them and how a lawyer and, and clients uh, approach them. And so as a matter of full disclosure, as Anna mentioned, uh, I was one of the co-authors of an amicus brief that was filed on behalf of the Association for Professional Responsibility Lawyers, known as APRL or APRL. Now, as befits our organizational interest, we focused on the lawyer-client interaction at the time of the communications that later become the subject of an attorney-client privilege dispute. And we supported neither party, neither the government nor the law firm, by the way, because so much of the record was sealed that it was hard to figure out how applying <laughs> any particular standard uh, would play out, which, which also feeds into my view that really this is not <laughs> truly about the standards. Now here's the Reader's Digest version of our amicus brief. First, as the Supreme Court has said, an uncertain privilege is no better than no privilege at all. Second, a crucial piece of legal advice that lawyers typically need to give to clients is whether this very conversation or this very communication that we're having will or not will not be privileged if it's later subpoenaed. Third, lawyers are encouraged by the rules of professional ethics to counsel clients broadly rather than merely as law spouting computers. Putting these together, we concluded that the focus of any test or standard should be on certainty most of all. Let me do a quick. Okay, I am back, I think. Oh. Hold on one second. I'm looking at the wrong thing, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so we, we, we wanted to focus on certainty in the test, whatever it is, most of all. So although we preferred the DC approach to the singular all or nothing ninth circuit approach, as did almost all of the Amici, by the way, we suggested that trying to figure out what is a substantial purpose under the DC um, approach on the fly without a sense of what party or tribunal might later come knocking with a subpoena introduces further and unnecessary uncertainty. And that uncertainty could chill the free flowing communications that the attorney client privilege is designed to promote which benefits not just lawyers and clients, but society as a whole. Yes, substantial is a word that is often used in the law. And yes, there is some danger that the Ninth Circuit recognize of abuse of lawyers trying to 
be over-inclusive what they put on put in their communications. But on balance, we argued the best rule would be to say that the entire communication should be protected by the attorney-client privilege if any purpose of a dual-purpose communication is the seeking or giving of legal advice and thus don't need to decide either a prominent purpose or even the nitty-gritty of what is a significant purpose. So I will end with that and turn it back over to Anna, our moderator, and then back to the floor. Thank you so much for that good and thoughtful discussion. We especially appreciate you powering through and wish you a speedy recovery for your voice. As promised, I'll now touch briefly on two other cases scheduled to be heard this month. While I'm doing that, please collect your thoughts, submit any questions um, through the Q&A function again, and um, we'll be happy to turn to those shortly. So on January 11th, the court will hear argument in Financial Oversight Board, the Centro de Periodismo Investigativo, Inc., and apologies for making all the Spanish speakers in the audience cringe with that pronunciation. Um, at issue is whether Puerto Rico's Financial Oversight Board is immune from a lawsuit filed by a nonprofit press group seeking documents from the board. So as background, the Puerto Rico Oversight, Management and Economic Stability Act grants federal jurisdiction over claims against the Financial Oversight Board and claims arising under the act. The first circuit held that while the statutory language was not as precise as other statutes that have been found to abrogate sovereign immunity, certain provisions of the act here led to that result. The petitioner, the board, argues that the act says nothing about abrogating sovereign immunity, which the board has by virtue of Puerto Rico's sovereign immunity, and that a clear and unmistakable uh, statement is required to that effect to abrogate sovereign immunity. The press group, the respondent, obviously takes a different position, and it argues that territories are subordinated to Congress's plenary authority by the territory clause in the Constitution. Um, and therefore lacks any inherent sovereign immunity. So in other words, their argument is that Congress's territory clause power lets Congress subject territories to suit in any court for any claim. The group also argues that there's no clear statement rule for territories, that, that just applies to the states. But regardless, the statute here does express Congress's intent to subject the board to suit. So what's interesting about this case, I think, is that it involves a clause of the Constitution and a power that we don't see addressed very often. That's the Territories Clause, as well as sovereign immunity. So it should be an interesting one. The court will also hear Santos Zacharia v. Garland. It will hear argument on January 17th to address the question whether federal immigration law preclude the Federal Court of Appeals from reviewing an immigrant's claim that the Board of Immigration Appeals had engaged in impermissible fact-finding because the immigrant had not filed a motion to reconsider. The statutory provision at issue, 8 U.S.C. 1252 D.1, requires a non-citizen to exhaust all administrative remedies available to the alien as of right. The question is not, is not only whether to exhaust all administrative remedies requires the filing of a motion to reconsider with the Board of Immigration Appeals, but also whether that exhaustion requirement is jurisdictional or whether it can be waived or forfeited. The Fifth Circuit below dismissed Santos Zacharias' appeal for lack of jurisdiction, and it's a question the circuits are split on. So we'll have to wait and see which position the court sides with. So that rounds up our overview of the cases. There's still time to submit questions, and while you may be gathering your thoughts, I'll first Turn the floor over to our panelists to see if anyone wants to comment or ask questions of any of the others. Uh, I'm willing to start on this one. Uh, and it sort of goes to sort of all of the questions. One, um, with respect to the situation that Tessa did, uh, what I would like her to comment on or to explain is the very how the very distinctive status of the National Guard 
uh, plays into the jurisdictional dispute under the Federal Labor Relations Act. Uh, the National Guard is a dual status organization. Every member of the Guard receives two commissions, one to serve in the state militia and one to serve in the United States Army. And so what happens is the control over the, the situation with respect to uh, these various people is that when the Guard is called up into national service, they become exclusively under federal control. Otherwise, they remain under state control. Uh, uh, does this, in effect, influence the way in which one ought to think about this? Uh, because I would say, if you're talking about the employees, uh, does the dual status provisions apply to them? Or do it not? I'm not sure how that would be answered. So that would be the first question we want to know. And the second kind of uh, thing that one want to know is if it turns out that the primary state is that you're under state control and only occasionally you're called up into federal service, should that be decisive in saying that, in fact, these are not federal employees? Tessa? Thank you, Professor Epstein, for that. For those two questions, uh, they're great questions, and I'll start with the first one. The, the bargaining unit of employees in this case is made up of technicians who, as you point out correctly, are dual status, dual status, part federal, part state employees. And but I think it's important to remember that the relevant question is whether the Ohio National Guard as an agency itself is a federal agency, mm -hmm. taking a step back from the employees themselves. So the way that FLRA has reached its conclusion, as it appears, is it, it takes the status, the dual status of the federal employees and says, because these are federal employees, this in their employer, this agency must be a federal agency. And I think that that is where FLRA went wrong. Because in fact, it's the predominantly state. Yes, because it is controlled by the states, predominantly state. Yeah, I mean, what, for people who are curious about the history of this, uh, this developed after the uh, National Guard got into a huge battle in Congress. And I was, by the way, quite heavily involved in this. I don't know if anybody knew this over the question as to whether or not the guard units could be called over to send overseas. Um, under the 1952 statute, they could only be sent overseas with the consent of the governor. And for political reasons, many of the governors did not want to do it. This led to an effort on the part of the regular army reserve uh, to essentially end the guard as a separate independent and autonomous agency. And in order to fight that, uh, there was something known as the Montgomery uh, Amendment, which I helped draft with a man named Ed Philbin, which essentially uh, got rid of the government consent requirement and said you could only hold them back if you have cause in order to do so for a local emergency. Um, so, I mean, we did try to cut back a little bit on the state authority, but the truth about the matter is 95% of the time, most of the guard units are in fact state employees. And if you did a kind of preponderance test, then I think that you would probably come out right under this situation. But it can't be the case that if they're called up now, they're federal employees, and when they're sent back home, they're not. You have to pick one or another, and a sort of a dominant or a primary test applied across the board would come to your conclusion. So you know, that's why I asked the question. Um, I have a question to... Oh, let me, let me, I have a follow-up question to Tessa on this case, and then we'll, uh, if you had something else, uh, Richard, sure. and that is, I, I wondered, um, Tessa, in the, in the Ohio National Guard case, if, the, if anybody, either in the briefs or in the, uh, the opinions, either wondered about or worried about whether if you decide that the National Guard as an agency is a state agency, that there might be lurking there a commandeering issue, that if, if it is a true state, if it's a state agency, but we all know that the feds have a tremendous amount of control, operational control, might there be, so sort of harking back to the uh, sovereign immunity issue that, um, that was in the fourth, the last case 
that uh, Anna mentioned, have, was, have, was there any, even an inkling that there's a commandeering issue lurking here? Yes, that was a great point. That was a very significant point of contention um, oh. prior to the Supreme Court granting cert on the limited question of FLRA's jurisdiction. So the Supreme Court this time around will not be addressing that question of federalism and the commandeering question, but that that is all throughout the briefing in the Sixth Circuit. Oh, okay, so, so you're saying it was raised, but it just didn't make it to the Supreme Court. Oh, well, interesting, I mean, so my, my instinct was right. Oh, look, I mean, the commandeering issue in this particular case is very different from the one that you've seen uh, where you're trying to get sheriffs to do this, that, or the other thing, prints and so forth. Because what happened is uh, the crisis actually began in 1917. And what happened was the United States was now at war, and Woodrow Wilson had to raise federal troops. And the question was whether or not they could nationalize the state militia and put them into the army. And the correct argument is that you cannot possibly do this if the militia clause is going to create an independent body, which is designed to check the federal government that can only be called up for defensive purposes mm -hmm. and not offensive purposes. You can't do it. Uh, but Justice Pitney, who wrote the case, said, look, this is a political question. We don't want to get involved with it. Uh, so off they go. And then after the war, people started to look around and said, oh, my God, if these guys are all federal people, we're not going to be able to have the state guard do the traditional state government. So in 1931 or two, what they did is they passed a dual status statute, which said that you get two commissions when you graduate, one in the state militia and one in the, uh, uh, the federal government. And what we do is we organize the federal budget because uh, it's a large one for the state militias uh, through the militia clause, and we put them in the army for the other clause. And so this is not a case of trying to upset some sort of balance. Uh, the actual militia clause of the Constitution is a dual authority clause to begin with. So uh, the way in which it is written is it says the states are in charge of the militias until called into the active service of the United States, which cannot be done by the president unilaterally. It has to be done pursuant to a congressional statute. But in the interim, uh, they are supposed to train their soldiers under a discipline which is supplied by the federal government. So when these people are called up, they can become interoperable. And so if you have this kind of a mutual dependency back and forth, it's pretty hard to say that you're dealing with somebody who is a local sheriff, totally autonomous to begin with, right? And then you're dragging them into federal service and so forth. What you say is these guys from the very beginning in the constitutional framework have this divided sovereignty. And there are places in the constitution which do that and they create complete messes because they're very, very hard to police. And the other illustration of that is right now when we're dealing with more v. Harper, uh, if you start looking at the clause, it says, well, the United States can set these things, but time, place, and manner regulations are left to the state, and you have, again, the overlapping authority, and it's not quite clear how you flip it over. But I don't think the uh, commandeering objection is going to have anything like the power it does in the cases in which it was originally done, whether it was with the nuclear waste stuff or with the, uh, the gun control statutes. Um, I have a question for you, my friend, Bill. Um, it, it, look, my view about all of this stuff is, is that it, the distinctions that they're making are too refined. So can I put it to you in a slightly different fashion? Uh, it seems to me that the clear distinction that you make is that if somebody is preparing an accountant's return and just doing it the way my accountant does my return, he's, a guy, he's an accountant, he gets no particular privilege. Uh, and if it turns out he's got a law degree and he practices law from time to time, what we ask is which hat he's wearing at the particular moment. But I think, in fact, if he's wearing his lawyer's hat to try and figure out how you redact every document in every case, it's just crazy. And so I think and that it, what the better thing to do is to grant the privilege of this sort of predominantly standard legal work. And the, the question I wanted to ask you I assume in most of these cases, if you can't get these private papers, there's still other documents that you get if you're the government that try to figure out when there's no claim of privilege whatsoever that can help you establish whether or not there's a tax offense. And so I would have thought that the existence of these alternatives um, would be an argument which would work in favor of your position. Is that right? Yes, 
Well, I think so, but, but I, I want to you know, first start out with we were in basic agreement when uh, my view, both from the point of view of a brief writer for April, but also just my, my own personal view, uh, I use the view you use. It's you know it's it's the, the gradations are too fine. I said it's slicing the bologna too thinly. Yeah, yeah, same agree. same deal. We we agree with that, and we agree on that. And I think that one of the reasons why I sort of felt that this sort of unease about really looking carefully at the language of the opinions is precisely that they tiptoe around these things. They say dual purpose this, dual purpose that, yeah. but the very difficulty of deciding which is which just simply you know, turns it in on itself. I will say though that the pretty much all of the opinions and all of the briefs do make a distinction, which I do think is valid. And I, I mentioned it briefly in passing that if there is a situation in which the accountant even if it's a lawyer, yeah. is just simply following along well-established principles, that doesn't count as legal work. Uh, and, and that's fine. Um, but, but I do agree with you that in the end, mm -hmm. the, the reason that April took the view that the less complexity, the better, is that it just clears the board. Do your thing. If yeah, and in most cases, even in this case, the government is going to be able to get, first of all, they've got all of the documents that were actually filed. Uh, they've got a lot of other documents. And in this case, um, you know, if they, if you adopted our more radical position of saying, as long as part of it is legal advice, you get nothing. What is the, what is the, uh, what is the government really losing? Not very much because the, the, uh, the district court allowed all of those redactions anyway. Here you'd get, you'd redact everything and you wouldn't have to spend thousands and thousands of court and magistrate hours arguing over it anyway. Yeah, so yeah, I agree with you that that's the implication. And I think one of the, one final thought, the sort of even more underlying um, principle is not, it's not at issue in this case, is really this whole long ongoing debate about what is the practice of law and what should we wall off for lawyers only and therefore reward with the prize of attorney-client privilege, what is the practice of law, but not the unauthorized practice of law. All of those issues, I think, are not presented here, but they're really, I think, lurking and underlying a lot of this. All right. Anna, could I ask you a question? Um, about the Puerto Rican case with PROMESA which has been a long and sort of complicated situation, territories and everything else. Uh, but the one issue uh, that you didn't stress, and I'm just curious how it plays out, is in that particular case, what they were asking for was not to impose a various kinds of liability on somebody, but they were asking to get certain kinds of documents which would allow them to deal with the way in which this thing worked. And my view is that sovereign immunity when it comes to doctrine, you know, getting documents to figure out whether the government is legal or illegal, it would be a terrible abuse to use that thing because then it means that they cannot be subject to any kind of sanctions of any sort, political or otherwise. And so is that something which you think um, should weigh in the balance to uh, deny the claim of sovereign immunity in this particular case, which would be my inclination or am I missing something? Well, you're right that it's not, you're right that it's not really addressed in the issue presented or in the briefs. And you know, there may be other ways to get documents from the board, but the way this has been presented is as an issue of sovereign immunity. So it, you know, it, mm -hmm. it is interesting how that practical effect and practical issue may kind of seep in. Um, and it is interesting that it's not been really directly addressed. 
in these cases, at least in the, the direct briefs. But I mean, I, th I think it's sort of important. And the other question on the other case, I mean, I looked at that statute. My attitude is if you have a statute which says you can only do this if you do that, um, how do we decide uh, whether or not those things can be waived? It's certainly not written as a jurisdictional statute, like you know, you only get diversity jurisdiction if you have $75,000 in controversy and so forth. Uh, so my inclination is to say that it's not a jurisdictional provision. Is that correct, do you think, or not? You know, I think that's probably right because you typically do see jurisdictional requirements set out so clearly. Um, and here that's that's not really the case. It's a kind of a statutory provision um, that's not stated as, as, clear, as clearly as juris, being jurisdictional. So um, yeah, you know, I think that that's probably right, but we'll see what the court wants to do with it. If I can just add one point to that though, Richard, it is true that in diversity and a lot of other statutory claims, the jurisdictional aspect is in there, but there's a huge jurisprudence of justiciability, constitution-based justiciability, that the case in controversy justiciability that ultimately <laughs> results in a finding of no jurisdiction, no, no subject matter jurisdiction yeah. uh, in the federal courts. And so, there can be cases, don't know enough about this case, where you could read in, you could say, but wait a second, if you allow jurisdiction here, then you have put the courts into a situation of divide, deciding that something's not a case in controversy and so on. And therefore, there's there can't be jurisdiction citing Marbury versus Madison, for example. Okay, is, is there anything else before we take a couple of questions from the audience? I had a quick question for Professor Epstein. Ah, yeah. If the court determines that the NLRB is preempted from deciding those property disputes, what do you think the remedy is for those people, those, those plaintiffs? Oh, it, 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 I think the question is, if they decide that there is preemption so that you can't bring the state toward action, well, the NRB has no power whatsoever to give any kind of property damage uh, for the willful destruction of property. And so it's that was the reason why it is, if you look at all the earlier cases, Justice Frankfurter essentially said that I'm going to give the preemption to stuff which has to do with, you know, who's a member of a union who's not a member of the union, who can vote in this election, who could not. And so what he is talking about in the initial paragraph of his decision is a case which is absolutely right at the core of what it is that is done. And I think it's perfectly correct to say that if the board doesn't want to take up an organizational hearing, uh, then it turns out the California can't clear, state courts should not be allowed to decide, hey, this is an unfair labor practice, even if the Supreme Court doesn't look at Boy doesn't look at it, we do, and then give damage. And so uh, Garmin was a case in which that's exactly what they did. Nobody's claiming that this has anything to do with that. This is a rather fiendish kind of skill, uh, thing, in which what they're doing is they're gaining enormous amount of bargaining leisure by engaging in the willful destruction of property. Uh, Garmin has the violence exception in multiple places. And so does violence include the intentional destruction of property for a collateral motive, which is itself dubious? I think the answer to that question is yes. I actually, when I looked at it, at the beginning, I was kind of puzzled one way or another. Then I went and I reread Garmin, and it seems pretty clear to me uh, that the National Labor Relations Board is designed quite consciously to try to figure out how it is that you organize uh, the union situation starting from organizational drives all the way through to unfair practice, labor practices. And we don't want state courts uh, deciding what is an organizational drive, what is an unfair practice. Uh, but this is a tort case of a perfectly simple variety. Um, and unless you really want to say that, that they haven't done anything wrong by turning off the engine and letting this stuff freeze inside these trucks, uh, causing enormous damages, uh, then you have to say this is on the torch side of the particular line. Uh, and, and I don't 
I, I frankly think it will be nine nothing on this. Uh, uh, you know, let me give you another version. One of the, the, the great weasel words of the English language is the word incidental. And, you know, you could do all sorts of terrible things. And then when somebody suffers damages, we'll say it's only incidental. And so the, the one that involves in labor cases, and this is not about this problem, is that you do have a strike, right? And what you do is you shut down the transportation and the children cannot go to school. And there are all sorts of dislocations when parents have to quit work and the rest of it. And, you know, in my mind, interference with advantageous relationships that create that kind of dislocation is a tort and has been one for a very long time. The way one deals with this under these statutes is to say, no, 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 these are just incidental damages. And so they, they don't take into account which is a view of remoteness of damage, which is extraordinarily narrow. And what you're saying, in effect, it's the parents' problem, not their problem. And what it does is it underestimates the social cost associated with uh, unionization. But in this case, when they say it's just incidental damage, it, I, how could it be that when it's the workers themselves that are doing this to the very equipment in question? And so the way I would put it is this. If you're going to authorize a system which has strikes, and permits them to take place, and you shut down a thing, and it's in the transportation industry, and you know that all this stuff is going to happen, that's necessarily contemplated by the statute as an inevitable consequence of the strike. And so if the statute is constitutional, uh, then the incidental damage is absolutely necessary to do it. But there's nothing whatsoever which says when you're going to have strike, uh, that on the day that the strike begins, you could blow up property or destroy it in some fashion. Um, so this is not sort of the incidental consequence of closing the business down. This is essentially wrecking the business at the same time that you're closing it down. And that distinction, I think, is maintainable. And there was not the slightest effort on the part of the Washington Supreme Court to get that particular issue right. I think we should take some questions or what? Great. Well, let's turn to the first question, and it's about the FLRA case. So, Tess, I'm going to ask for your thoughts first. The question is, can you expand on the First Amendment implications of the FLRA case? Oh, certainly. Um, the, the collective bargaining agreement between the Ohio National Guard and its union, representing the group of employees, includes two provisions in particular. And these types of provisions, I will say, are quite common in um, public sector collective bargaining, but it doesn't make them doesn't make them right or lawful. And as a reminder, the public employees have the right to choose whether to associate with a labor union. And they have the right to choose whether to financially support a labor union. And the first provision that implicates these employees' First Amendment rights would be the provision that forces a union member, someone who has chosen to be a member of the union, to remain a member of that union and remain financially supporting the union for, a, for one year they're locked in. And, and usually the way that works, union members pay, they, they pay dues to the union, typically through automatic payroll deductions by their employer, the, in this case, the, the government. Just like any other payroll deduction, their, their dues money is being automatically deducted from their wages and given from their employer to the union. So in this case, a provision that takes away a federal employee's or takes away a public employee's choice to stop financially supporting a union, takes away their choice to stop associating with a union, forces membership, forces payment, mm -hmm. violates employees' First Amendment rights. And then once you get past that first year of forced membership, the, the collective bargaining agreement provides for a small period of time, a small window period during which employees may resign from the union, during which employees may stop their dues deductions coming out of their paychecks. But this brief window is only about a two week window during the year. And if you happen to miss that window, or if you happen to not know when that window is, or if 
there is administrative confusion or uh, disorganization and the union or the employee mm -hmm. has lost track of when that window is, then that employee is trapped as a member of the union. They're unable to resign from the union and unable to choose to stop financially supporting the union. So the way this ties back to the case at hand is that if the Supreme Court decides that FLRA does indeed have jurisdiction over the Ohio National Guard, then the collective bargaining agreement between the Ohio National Guard and its union will be revived. And I should mention that this is a collective bargaining agreement that was is expired by a lot. So this old dead collective bargaining agreement will come back with these provisions that implicate thousands of employees First Amendment rights. And then that's something that I think the Supreme Court may yeah. be interested in. And we may see some questions during oral, oral argument this coming Monday, the 9th, about these First Amendment implications. Just to mm -hmm. add to what Tessa said, I think the so-called Hotel California rules, which you put all sorts of condition precedents on the ability to withdraw from the union, uh, you have only two weeks to do it, you have to file certain kinds of papers, there has to be other kinds of approvals and so forth. I think, in effect, that one can say that they're illegal under the Janus case because they're That's unduly burdensome within it, and that I think the Supreme Court could come up mm -hmm. and say with something like this, is that we think, in effect, that any worker at any time upon giving one month's notice that it wishes to withdraw from the union can do so at the end of 30 days, no matter what else is going on. There's absolutely nothing whatsoever about those restriction rules which are designed to further the Janus policy. These are all efforts to try and make sure that you choke it off and they've been remarkably successful at it. And this is an illustration of something that often happens. Uh, you take the Washington court, for example, and the way in which it butchered the Garmin case. If it's going to face the Hotel California rules, my guess is they would basically want to uphold them. And so what we do is we have a series of very pro-union inferior courts in the state system, in the federal system, and a federal Supreme Court, uh, which doesn't exercise constant oversight of what's going on. And so when the cats are away, the mice start to play and they have a great time of it. This has also happened in the takings area where the Supreme Court says, uh, we want to have a tough look at temporary takings. And then 35 years later, you can't find a single case in which the procedural stuff has not blocked the substantive challenge. So I think this is actually a recurrent problem uh, because the court is considerably farther to the right uh, than is most of the state courts. It's going to come up here. Uh, we have those cases, 303 Creative, where every lower court has always upheld the claim of the state to run its anti-discrimination law. And I think the Supreme Court's going to overturn that. And then you're going to get, again, the same kind of back, you know, rear guard action on the part of local commissions and courts and so forth in an effort to undo what the Supreme Court has said. And I think they have to be really cognizant about that. And they have to be more aggressive in taking cases that are follow on if it turns out they see serious deviations from what the original principle was about. We'll next take a question from an audience member with his hand raised. Samuel, please ask your question. Hello. We can hear you. We can't hear anything. Oh, I thought I could hear it. I can't hear a thing. I can see Anna. Okay, well, let's move on to another question then. And um, if Samuel's microphone starts working, we can come back. Um, there's a question uh, to you, Professor Hodes. Didn't Congress add some type of accountant client privilege to the Internal Revenue Code? If so, what is the relevance of that? Yeah, thanks. I, I saw that question in the uh, chat and I, I'm not uh, familiar with the specifics of it, but um, and so I'd actually, that was uh, Herman Uma's question. I'd actually turn it back and to, to get some of the specifics of it. But my hunch is that there was, that that, that privilege or quasi-privilege is limited to dealings between uh, taxpayers and accountants and the IRS. But in the case that's before the Supreme Court, 
we're dealing with the, the real evidentiary rule of evidence privilege in the court system, um, which uh, most definitely does not include a, um, an accountant's privilege. And then the, the, the opinions did talk about that. Lawyers' privilege is one thing, accountants' privilege doesn't exist. And the question then, as, as Richard suggested, is what happens if the same person is wearing two different hats? But, uh, but uh, so my guess is, and I'm just ducking a little bit, is that there is, I, that sounds familiar that there is such a statute, but that it probably does not apply in the court system generally. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question. And it is, in the Puerto Rico case, will the insular cases be at issue? Um, just this quick background, the insular cases are just a set of opinions about um, the constitutional rights of the inhabitants of territories that the US acquired, um, mostly in the Spanish-American War, War, but in other cases, in other, um, in other ways as well. And, you know, the parties did not address those cases in their briefs. And I think it's because, you know, really what's at issue is sovereign immunity. And, you know, you may be able to come up with some indirect argument about how um, citizens' rights are somehow implicated, but it doesn't really get to their constitutional rights so much as um, the rights of the Oversight Board in Puerto Rico and Congress's power um, to provide immunity or, or take away yeah. immunity or subject the board to um, federal court jurisdiction. Yeah, look, I mean, on the insular cases, uh, what you did is you had a wholesale absorption of, of another country or place. And the question then was, uh, this place had its own set of rules that dealt with various kinds of protections for individual rights and criminal proceedings and so forth. And what the Supreme Court said, I think it was Chief Justice Tam, is so long as you're dealing with a viable legal system that has been absorbed into the United States, uh, we do not have to give the protections that American citizens get in the American states to these people uh, because there's already a working system which has given them the kind of protection that they had beforehand. Um, recently, Justice Gorsuch, I think, came forward and uh, sort of announced that he was not entirely happy with this. And this is a much larger question, uh, but to what extent do people who are aliens in the territories have rights that are less than American citizens? And in connection with people who are subject to detention, uh, one of the things that happens if you detain them overseas, they're not going to be entitled perhaps to get habeas corpus, whereas if you detain them in the United States, they would be entitled to do so. And my view about this is actually reasonably favorable to the claims of the uh, foreigners who are suing the United States, the aliens. If you look at the structure of the 14th Amendment, the only clause uh, that applies to citizens alone is the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Uh, both the uh, Due Process and Equal Protection Clause, which are much more concerned with criminal kinds of activities, apply to all persons, and uh, the kind of persons they apply to, therefore, would be aliens. And so I think if there's an alien who is brought into contact with the criminal system, it shouldn't matter whether it was overseas or, the United, or within the United States. The operative question is, is the United States the sovereign that's calling the shots? And if it is, then it seems to me that these constitutional protections should apply. This is going to come up again uh, because the recent literature on the insular clauses uh, uses the very evocative terms that this is a colonial system of one kind or another. And that's always an open invitation to say we have to re-examine uh, what's going to take place. But I agree with Anna. Uh, sovereign immunity is just not the place in which you can argue that point. Uh, what sovereign immunity does is it suggests that when you're dealing with territories, there are going to be other issues that are going to come up, and they may more implicate uh, the insular cases than the current case does. Well, that excellent insight is the perfect place to conclude our program. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the Federal Society. Um, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Goodbye, everybody. Well, let me just say before you uh, jump off uh, that uh, per usual, this was a great preview of the next sitting. Our thanks to Anna, Tessa, Richard, and Bill for their great insights today. Um, I, I think uh, someone said at the outset that this might be a, a sleepy sitting, but the analysis that today was anything but.
Uh, always a pleasure to have the benefit of such great legal minds. Uh, we welcome audience feedback by email at info at fedsoc.org. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.